today's speaker, who is Dr. Mark Moyer, summa cum laude from Harvard University, PhD from Cambridge University, and an eminent historian and scholar of military history, but with a focus on assisting the Defense Department and generals in solving current problems. He's been a consultant for a number of years and an author and would like to welcome him. Today's topic is the title of his most recent book, Oppose Any Foe, The Rise of America's Special Operations Forces. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Moyer. Thanks, Frank. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be back here. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, primarily about this new book. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but uh, focus on some key points. Uh, hopefully, will spark your interest in reading more. Uh, this book came about while I was teaching at the Joint Special Operations University in Tampa, where we taught a course on the history of special operations and then realized that there wasn't really a good single volume account. And there's been all sorts of stuff written. A lot of it's just uh, sort of personal stories. There's some st stuff that's a little more analytical, but nothing kind of covering the gamut. So this book starts with, uh, you know, it's generally considered the first American Special Operations Forces in 1942 and uh, takes it up through the present. So I'm, before I get into that, I uh, also want to show this slide because there's a great amount of confusion uh, among the public, even within the national security establishment, about what special operations forces actually are. Uh, you hear about them all the time, but but there's some things worth knowing to, to kind of keep you oriented and, and uh, will also help you understand what this is all about. So the top there is U.S. Special Operations Command, which is a four-star headquarters in Tampa, and that is the umbrella organization for all special operations forces. So special operations forces encompasses everything that's up here. Uh, now, each of the services down below has their own special operations command, uh, starting with the Army, moving across the Navy, Air Force. Far right is Marine. Joint Special Operations Command is something else, which I will get into, but it also falls under uh, SOCOM. Uh, the uh, particular important thing to, to note is within this the left-hand bucket, U.S. Uh, Army Special Operations Command are the special forces. And I say this because people often mix up special forces with special operations forces. The special forces are an army. They are also called the Green Berets. Uh, the army also has other special operations forces like the Rangers uh, Delta Force. Uh, the Navy component you're probably most familiar with is the Navy SEALs, but there's some others in there. Uh, AFSOC, Air Force Special Operations Command, uh, Lots of aircraft, uh, pararescue, tactical air controllers. Um, JSOC, I said that's a special thing we'll get into, but that is uh, the principal um, elements in that are the uh, SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force. Um, and then MARSOC, relatively recent creation, which are the uh, uh, Marine uh, Raiders. So I'm going to go walk through a little bit of this chronologically. Um, so to understand the formation of the U.S. Special Operations Forces, you first have to understand the British Special Operations Forces, uh, the commandos, which were formed uh, in the aftermath of Dunkirk. Is the, raise your hand if you've seen Dunkirk. I mean, a lot of you have probably seen that. So uh, as you may recall in Dunkirk, you know, they get a lot of the, they get the troops out, but they don't get a lot of the heavy equipment out. And so Churchill, after Dunkirk, is faced with this problem that he, uh, doesn't have a lot of heavy equipment, and he also, like many other Brits, has World War I on his mind, and the idea of sending another huge land force into the continent is not very appealing to him. And so he comes up with the concept of uh, coastal raiding uh, using principally the commandos. So these are sort of elite units that are trained to, to go raid the coast, uh, principally occupied France. Uh, to discombobulate the Germans um, while he's at the same time trying to get the Americans and the Soviets to, uh, to do a lot of the heavy lifting. So uh, these are formed in 1940. Uh, so when the U.S. enters the war, 19, uh, end of 1941, it's looking for ways to partner with the Brits. Uh, 
trying to get involved early on in the war. And since the commandos seem to be the flavor of the moment on the British side, the U.S. decides it wants to form a, a similar program, and, and this is what becomes the, uh, the U.S. Army Rangers. And William Orlando Darby is the officer who is put in charge of setting it all up. It's done uh, very informally, very different from how we would uh, do it bureaucratically today. Uh, but the Rangers are just getting going when this, the uh, Dieppe debacle takes place in August of 1942, where um, the co a force of commandos and uh, other elite units try to raid this uh, port in France and are almost entirely wiped out. And this really is the uh, death knell for the strategy of just raiding the coast of France. They realize the raids aren't even successful. They're not really having much impact. Uh, and so the mission that the, raider, the rangers have initially, uh, by the time they're actually ready to do it, is, is, is uh, gone, essentially. So then they, they try to figure out how else they can use these forces. And uh, they're used in North Africa, where it's a pretty easy campaign. Uh, Italy is where they really um, meet sterner tests. So they go in, this is a chronology of where they go. And they start in Sicily with the invasion. Um, They'll go up in Salerno in September 43. Uh, and in both these cases, if you're familiar with history of World War II, the, the U.S. keeps trying to trap the Germans, uh, but the Germans keep escaping to the north before we can get around them. So the third attempt to, to do that at, at Anzio in January of 1944, uh, the Rangers, they go in. Again, the, the invasion bogs down and uh, for a week or so, they're sitting around, the, the Allied forces are not doing much, and they're finding order, uh, pressure from above to move east into the interior to cut off the German supply lines before the Germans can, can get out of there. Uh, and the Rangers, which by now have uh, three battalions, uh, are one of the units sent in, and they're sent to the town of Cisterna, which you can see to the northeast of Anzio there. Uh, this turns out to be... Uh, a uh, terrible disaster for the Rangers because when they get to Cisterna, they find out there's an entire German armored division there that they didn't know about. And uh, two of the battalions are completely destroyed, and the third is very badly injured. Uh, and as a result of this, the Rangers will not be used again in Italy, and this will, will deal a major blow to the whole concept of Rangers, these elite uh, units. On the Marine Corps side, there's a somewhat similar experience during the uh, war. So uh, after hostilities with Japan break out, uh, James Roosevelt, who's the son of uh, the president, has this idea to form raider units, which he uh, gets the idea from Evans Carlson, who's a Marine Corps lieutenant colonel who had met Mao and was uh, sort of an uh, enthusiastic proponent of Mao's guerrilla warfare. And so they wanted to do this in some sense as a Maoist type force. It never quite became that. It, it ended up being more like the Rangers. Uh, but uh, it was still a departure, an elite unit. And this encountered fierce resistance from the Marines who had traditionally opposed forming elite units. They already considered themselves to be elite. Um, the Marine Corps Commandant comes out against this proposal, says this would be a bad idea. Uh, but the president. Uh, He's got the, his son on the one hand, Marine Corps Commandant on the other. Who do you think he listens to? He listens to his son, and so the, the Raiders are formed. So, you know, we think that only it's a recent phenomenon that family get involved in presidential politics, not so. <laughs> uh, so that's how the Raiders come about. They have some early successes, but um, like the Rangers, uh, eventually uh, the war becomes highly conventional, and there's a need for troops, and so they put the raiders into more conventional type operations, uh, but they're really not equipped for that. They have, they're less heavily equipped because of the need for speed. And so at, uh, in the New Georgia campaign, they also take uh, heavy losses in conventional conflict, and they will also be uh, uh, dissolved as a result of that. Uh, now the Navy uh, has its own uh, special operations forces in World War II, the Frogmen. Uh, and uh, unlike some of the others, these are really created because someone had identified a particular need. Uh, in the middle of the war, they start to realize that with all these amphibious landings, the enemy's putting up obstacles to get in the way. So 
their job principally is to go in and d destroy those obstacles prior to an amphibious assault. And they do a very good job both in Normandy uh, and the Pacific, Gu uh, Guam being the, the most notable example. Then we also have the OSS, Office of uh, Strategic Services, has its own special operations force forces, uh, and these will be the other role model that come out of World War II. There's William Donovan, the head of the OSS. Uh, and Donovan is keen to get in on this. You know, you know, his intelligence is his primary mission, but he's also interested in doing these special operations military forces. Um, but he has, a pr he, he has to go get permission from the theater commanders. Um, Nimitz and MacArthur don't want anything to do with him. They're afraid he's going to be spying on them. Uh, but he goes to the China-Burma-India theater, where General Stilwell doesn't have many troops, and he would like to have some. So he agrees to let uh, the OSS into his theater. So the OSS forms uh, what's called Detachment 101, which uh, was created. They gave it the name because uh, it, they originally thought it was going to be Detachment 1, but they thought then the enemy would know they only had one unit. So 101 sounded like we had a lot more units. Uh, but it is actually the only unit. But they go in and work. Uh, they go into Burma, and uh, initially five out of their six missions are failures. The teams they send in disappear uh, because it turns out most of the population there is sympathetic to the Japanese occupiers and turn them in. But in the Kachin territories, uh, they do achieve success because the population there hates the Japanese. Um, so they then go out and find this charismatic leader living in the Kachin territories who uh, they provide weapons to, uh, and his army is really spectacularly successful. Um, so we, OSS keeps funneling money in there, and this becomes uh, a model for future uh, sort of resistance support operations. The OSS also has the Jedburgh program in France, which is uh, a program done in conjunction with the Brits and the French. Uh, they have three-man teams, and their mission is to go in behind enemy lines uh, during the uh, Normandy invasion to uh, team up with the French resistance to help support them, uh, and the idea is that they will cause trouble for the Germans that will interfere with the movement of uh, German forces to Normandy. Uh, most of you know, the Germans are caught by surprise there, so uh, that they need to buy time for more Allied forces to come in uh, to Normandy. Uh, the Jedburgs tactically are fairly successful. But, uh, I do like to point out that their impact was actually quite limited because the, there's sort of a myth uh, that has grown up that they were sort of responsible for the D-Day successes. But if you look, um, these are all the, on the left are all the forces that go in to support the resistance. The little yellow 222 is the Jedburgs. The one above it is another OSS program, and the right is the British SAS. So, um, that's worth keeping in mind. Also, you know, in terms of what disrupted the um, offensive, the deception campaign that was used to uh, keep the uh, Germans to the east was by far the most important, and secondarily, the bombing campaign. And the resistance, uh, the role of resistance was really uh, not altogether that important in, in interfering with German troop movements. Uh, yeah, sometimes the formatting gets weird on this, but uh, what they're supposed to say is that after the war, everybody but the Navy frogmen get uh, disbanded. Um, so all the OSS units, all the Army units, the Marine Corps Raiders are all gone. Uh, there's a you know, perception that most of them have not been very successful, uh, and this is a, a problem that will continue to haunt them, that frogmen are kept around because they are the ones that are seen to have clearly made uh, an important contribution during the, uh, during the war. Uh, there's a chapter on Korea in the book. I won't you know, skip over that in the interest of time. Um, John F. Kennedy is uh, the biggest supporter of Special Operations Forces that uh, we've ever had in the White House. And he decides that uh, he is going to ramp up the, uh, special, the Army Special Forces, which at this time are very small. Uh, they're created in the 50s, in the end of Korea. Uh, and so the idea is, well, more is obviously better. But the problem they run into is that you know, the more you have of these elite forces, the lower you have to um, make your standards. And you, so you see that, you know, 90% of people were failing out at the school when he comes in. But in order to get this big number, they, are, they have to reduce that to 30%. So the elite character uh, of the forces uh, takes a hit, and, and also their reputation. 
Uh, uh, Kennedy also pushes the uh, other services to create new units, and so the Navy SEALs are born in 1961. Uh, they are mainly a counterinsurgency force because that is what Kennedy thinks is most important at the time. It, they will move away from that over time. Uh, Vietnam, there's all sorts of stuff that goes on. A mixed record here. Uh, spent a lot of time going through each of these, but uh, bottom line is that at, coming out of Vietnam, the, uh, there's this perception um, among much of the conventional military that special operations forces helped get us into Vietnam, and that's not, not really true. Um, special forces have their own myths about how it was all conventional army's fault, which is also not true. But as a result of this, the special forces take a big cut, um, as do the Navy SEALs. Um, they, uh, they've been built up by Kennedy enough, though, that they're able to survive, unlike past wars where they were totally uh, cut out. So um, the, uh, I mean, I'm, who knows what uh, movie that's from? In the front. Close. Anyone else? It's Airplane 2, but uh, anyway. <laughs> the, uh, so as you may remember, that this is born, you know, 1970 is a big hostage uh, taking uh, period, and so you know, coming out of Vietnam, the, the Special Operations Forces don't really have a lot to do necessarily, and they're trying to prove why they are worthy of funding from the Congress. Uh, so this mission comes along, and this is something that will be crucial for Special Operations Forces going forward. Uh, it will lead in 1974 to the creation or the revival of the Rangers. Uh, 1977, Delta Force is created, which is Army like the Rangers, but it's, it's considered an even more elite force. They decided they really wanted to be super elite, and then in 1980, the Navy decides that it wants to be as cool as the Army, and so they create SEAL Team 6 to, to uh, do pretty much what Delta Force uh, can do. There, there are actually very few hostage rescue situations during this period, or after for that matter, but uh, it's instrumental in getting these organizations going. Um, now there is then, you know, uh, the first real test of of Delta Force comes at, uh, at Operation Eagle Claw, where they go in to rescue the Iranian hostages, but they have problems. Uh, they, they are pre-staging helicopters, and uh, they send in eight helicopters to uh, for the final leg of the mission, and they need to get six, and only five of them make it through, so they abort the mission, and then there's this crash that leads to uh, a number of U.S. casualties. So a very sad day for Special Operations Forces uh, but it does lead to some very interesting reforms and very valuable forms, reforms from the point of uh, special operations. So the, uh, what they've done in this operation and others is they kind of cobbled together a headquarters when the, uh, the time for the operation arose, and that was seen as being inefficient, um, uh, as you might imagine. So the solution to that problem is to create JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command, which is a, a separate entity uh, so it's a sort of a standing headquarters that can be used when the next type of thing comes along. And a few of the, as I said, the most elite units, Delta and uh, SEAL Team 6, are assigned to JSOC. The other big problem they had was the ad hoc air units. So the, the problems they had getting the helicopters to there was the result of bringing in pilots from different places who weren't necessarily familiar with the aircraft they were flying. And so this then leads to the formation of the 160th um, Aviation, uh, Special Operations Aviation Battalion uh, Leader Regiment, the, which are also known as the Night Stalkers. The, um, uh, and who knows which uh, Chevy Chase movie the photo on the right is from? It's actually not Chevy Chase, but it kind of looks like him, doesn't it? Sam That's Sam Nunn, yes. Yes, yeah, so yes, William Cohen and Sam Nunn come together for the, the Nunn-Cohen Amendment, of, and this is also um, driven by the uh, Iran hostage experience. Uh, but on the tail of Goldwater Nichols, there are proponents of special operations forces who think that special operations have kind of gotten a raw deal, and they need special privileges and protections from Congress to uh, so that they don't keep getting trampled on by the conventional military, which is never really embrace them. So there are four big things that come out of this. One is the creation of SOCOM, Special Operations Command, which I mentioned in the first slide, the big umbrella organization headquartered in Tampa. And this gives them a four-star uh, 
general, which is very important because in the past, a lot of times you'd had a, a you know, special forces colonel dealing with a three-star conventional general, and that didn't work out very well for them generally. Uh, the second thing they get is the uh, ASD SOLIC, or Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict, which uh, gives them a proponent in the Pentagon at a senior level. The third thing is uh, MFP 11, or Major Force Program 11, which is a dedicated funding line for special operations, so this way they, they uh, aren't constantly getting stiffed by the rest of the military. Uh, and then the fourth thing they get is a list of nine missions that are said to be special operations uh, missions. So things seem to be really going well for SOF. Um, then they run into a uh, problem in Desert Storm. Uh, you know, one thing that Nun Cohen did not give them, and there's, people often get confused about this, Nun Cohen did not let the SOCOM actually control its forces. So once the forces were um, trained and equipped and sent into a theater, the theater uh, regional combatant commander uh, had authority over them. So CENTCOM had authority in Desert Storm. And so it was up to General Schwarzkopf to decide what use to make of special operations forces. And he was not a big fan of special operations forces. Uh, and in the early stages, was kind of left them on the sidelines. And so General Steiner, who is the SOCOM commander, goes and begs and pleads to, you know, please let me, uh, we really want to get our forces in there. Be, you know, it's a wartime. These are aggressive uh, military people, they want to get in on the fight, and uh, but for the most part, uh, Schwarzkopf, you know, uh, holds them at bay, and so um, they they end up feeling this source of resentment that basically they missed out on most of the you know ex excitement of uh, Desert Storm. Uh, next watershed moment for Special Operations Forces will be 9/11, um, and this will will be fundamental in changing, you know, up until this time, special operations forces have been really struggling to find missions to do. And a after this point in time, uh, the, the, we're going to be in a situation which continues today that there's more for them to do than they actually have manpower to do. So you probably recall you know, one of the first things that happens after 9-11 is that uh, U.S. sends in CIA and special forces to Afghanistan to partner with the Northern Alliance and other resistance groups against the Taliban. Uh, and initially, a lot of people think this is just sort of a, um, a nuisance we're creating for the Taliban. Um, and so when they actually succeed in taking down the Taliban with the Northern Alliance, uh, a lot of people think this is sort of the new uh, uh, generation of warfare, that we no longer need these big armies. We have you know, a few special operators. They hop on horseback, and they have their laser pointing devices to guide munitions. Um, in fact, so when you get to Iraq two years later, some people are thinking we could use the same model. Now, they, in the planning stage, they act, you know, figure out, in fact, Iraq is not Afghanistan. They, Iraq has a much uh, stronger army. There's not an equivalent of the Northern Alliance. So what special operators do there is conduct um, uh, diversionary operations in the west and north while the main thrust of the U.S. To ground invasion comes from the south. East. Um, that's pretty pretty successful as well. Um, so after Iraq, um, things don't go as well as we'd hoped. There's this insurgency that crops up, uh, and special operators are sent to go hunt down Bin Laden, or excuse me, not Bin Laden. Uh, we'll get to him in a minute. Uh, Saddam Hussein, um, and you know, a lot of people think Saddam and his sons, who the special operators also get, kind of the uh, uh, decided lack of cooperation, which created a lot of difficulties, but uh, over time they start working together and this will lead ultimately to suppression of the insurgency, uh, late 2007-2008. Uh, so as Iraq's winding down a bit, uh, there are new things to do in, in Afghanistan. And by this time there's a, a lot of concern in the special operations community that the special operations forces have become too preoccupied with this surgical strike mission, with the, you know, They've been for years now going into people's houses and arresting them or shooting people. And um, while that you know ha has its value, there's also this perception that they need to be doing what they were formed for originally, particularly special forces, which is to work with locals. And so there's this program called uh, Village Stability Operations. Is the U.S. side of it? They work with the Afghan local police or ALP. This really gets going about 2010. 
So the idea is to take these small teams of uh, American special operators from the different services, and they put them in a village to uh, help organize local security. They recruit these Afghan local police from the population, and uh, in some cases very successful. It depended a bit on local circumstances. Uh, you had a lot of social fractures within the country, and so where you had villages divided along ethnic or tribal lines, it sometimes ran into trouble. But this is generally fairly effective um, where, where it's done. Unfortunately, the software is not big enough to really do it on a countrywide basis. While they're doing that, then we have the killing of Osama bin Laden. And uh, of course, Americans are happy. I mean, who wouldn't be happy by the killing of Osama bin Laden? And, and this is touted initially by the administration as uh, sort of having proving the value of surgical strike uh, as a method. We, um, you know, the small team of uh, Americans go into Pakistan surreptitiously, take this guy out, and uh, this is also used in a, as a reason for reducing the American footprint in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, I tend to be, you know, emphasize some of the negative consequences that came out of this. Um, for one thing, it causes a lot of problems with what we were doing in Pakistan. Um, Special Operations Forces actually had a large presence in Pakistan. Uh, there were some very nasty uh, terrorist elements that we were trying to help them fight in Pakistan, and they all got kicked out because they don't like that we did this without telling them, um, which we kind of had to do because we knew if we told them we were doing this right in advance, they probably would have tipped off bin Laden. Um, but they also, uh, uh, CIA personnel in Pakistan are harassed. They shut down our main drone base in Pakistan, which we were using to target terrorists. Uh, and this also leads to a policy that increasingly emphasizes raids and surgical strikes, which um, I hope wrote a whole other book on this, if you're interested, called Strategic Failure, um, if you want lots more detail. But it uh, you know, leads to withdrawal from Iraq, Afghanistan, leads to a surgical strike strategy in Yemen that is uh, fails completely. Um, we also have, uh, and this is you know, the book published this year, but kind of cuts off 2016 because it takes a while for books to come out. So the last major thing that happens with SOF is that they are um, called upon to train uh, Syrian resistance forces, a uh, huge amount of money allocated to this program. and. Uh, a year into the program, when Congress asks about this, they're told that, uh, you know, they ask how many fighters are there, and, and uh, the CENTCOM commander, uh, Lloyd Austin, says, oh, well, there's four or five, and, and so they think, well, you mean four or five thousand, and it's actually, you know, four or five people are actually trained in there. So um, the program is, at that point, uh, shut down. Special Operations takes some blame, although I think you know, most people will tell you the, the real problem was the policy behind it, which was, uh, they insisted, for one thing, that you had to be someone who opposed ISIS but not Assad. And almost all of the people they were talking to did, uh, hated Assad, too. Um, and uh, they had just other restrictions that really uh, precluded the uh, recruitment of the kind of uh, numbers of people you needed. All right, so I'll, I'll run you through um, a few sort of overarching points that uh, I draw in the book. There, there are four kind of lines or themes that I follow in the book, so I'll do a few for me. So the first theme is presidential leadership. As presidents are often very involved and in, have been very involved in special operations. And uh, what we've usually seen is that presidents have, uh, who are interested, have very sort of naive views generally of what they are. A lot of it comes from pop culture. Uh, and, and so there's a, a need to really kind of educate them on, on realistically what these forces can and can't do, which is one of the things history can do. Um, another point is that certainly since Kennedy, even, you know, presidents who have not been in, in, interested in special operations forces when they came in uh, found themselves needing them once they were in office. So you know, Carter was not very interested, but then he has this Iran hostage problem he has to deal with, so that's what he's returned to. Um, you know, Bush wasn't particularly interested in special operations forces before 9-11, but then all of a sudden we have Afghanistan and Iraq uh, to deal with. Uh, third point on the presidency is that we've seen uh, the interest levels of presidents can, can fade very quickly, uh, which is something that you kind of have to prepare for. And then the left is uh, 
uh, Black Hawk Down in Somalia, where Clinton sends in, and this is in the book, I won't get into it here, but Clinton sends in the, sends in Delta Force to take out uh, the Somali warlord, uh, and when the helicopter crashes and people get killed, and this image gets posted, he uh, suddenly wants nothing to do with Special Operations Forces uh, for the rest of his presidency. Um, on the right there is a map of Afghanistan transition. You know, President Obama was became a big supporter after the bin Laden raid, but as time went on and he was getting impatient with Afghanistan, the you know, special operators wanted to stay in Afghanistan a lot longer than, than they were allowed to by the president. And part of that is because by this time he's no longer so interested in, in uh, what they're doing. Uh, second themes, roles and missions. Um, you know, if you're the Army or Navy or Air Force, you have certain things that are indisputably going to be yours um, no matter what happens. Special, operation, special Operations Forces really don't have anything like that. Um, uh, there's a few very specialized missions. You could say maybe like counter WMD capability might be that. But for the most part, um, they don't have exclusive claim to anything. And the conventional forces often are trying to do some of the same things. So they have to keep showing what they do is valuable. Um, and even if Congress says it's valuable, doesn't mean it is. Um, uh, we've seen in the case of you know, what you've tr prepared for and trained for turns out not to be what you're doing, so you have to figure out quickly something else to do. Um, on the right, it said uh, JSOC, or Special Operations Forces in Desert Storm, had prepared for all these things, but they weren't able to convince the regional commander that what they could offer was useful. Uh, the next war, I mean, we have historically a very poor record of actually predicting the next war. I mean, I get amused because there's people now who try to create all these mathematical models that will tell you where, what the next conflict's going to be, except they're always based on only the past, and so their predictive power is very low. Um, so reality is we, we usually get surprised um, by what comes next, which means you can't invest too heavily necessarily in one area. Um, to the exclusion of all others. Uh, I also think uh, COIN is uh, uh, military speed counterinsurgency. You know, there's been a lot of, uh, towards the end of Afghanistan and Iraq, the White House said we, we're not really going to be sized to do these counterinsurgency things anymore. You know, counterinsurgency was difficult and painful and unpopular, so we're just not going to do that. Uh, but unfortunately, um, we don't always get to choose whether we want to do that. Um, you know, if you look at the counterinsurgencies we fought, the presidents didn't really want to do them, but, but uh, you know, the left, you know, Vietnamese communists kind of forced us to do that. Uh, on the right, Saddam Hussein, uh, or uh, after Saddam Hussein, the Ba'athist insurgents uh, drew us into insurgency. So I think it's a mistake to kind of think that we're not going to have to do that again. Uh, the third theme is the effectiveness of special operations forces. A uh, few points here. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that um, our success in these is usually dependent mainly on the people who are already in that environment, whether it's the people we're supporting or, or the people we're opposed to, because uh, there's sometimes a sense um, that if we send in our superstar special operators that they're going to solve these problems. but in reality, um, they can only uh, contribute as much as, as their uh, allies are able to, to, uh, to permit. Um, Burma, a classic example, Afghan local police, um, same thing as I mentioned. You know, Afghan local police depended heavily, he heavily on who was in that village, who the leaders were, were there actually leaders who were going to work with you, and how strong was the uh, Taliban in that village. Uh, another important point is that the strategic effectiveness of SOF is, uh, is almost always limited by their scale. And there's been, especially within SOF, there are some who want to really say that SOF are a strategic instrument. Uh, the only, I think, one compelling example you can point to is the um, fall of the Taliban. Uh, you can make a pretty good case there. But other than that, uh, generally not true. The left is an example from Vietnam where they were very effective in mobilizing these highland villagers, but that was only one small part of the war. It wasn't, uh, they didn't have enough people to do that everywhere. Uh, on the right is uh, Tora Bora, where uh, special operators went in to try to find bin Laden at the end of 2001. Uh, but 
they didn't have enough manpower to cover that area, and in hindsight, probably would have been better to bring in a lot of, of additional uh, U.S. forces. Um, and then this point, uh, I touched on this a bit already, but um, usually they're not going to be strategically decisive. Strategic uh, precision strikes in Iraq and Afghanistan, although highly effective, were not strategically decisive. Uh, killing of bin Laden has not been uh, has not been decisive. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm just formatting here off a little bit. Um, basically, what this shows it. Uh, so, 1945, you had 12 million, uh, 12 million in the army. Soft were maybe 6,000. So, 0.05 percent of the military was soft. Today, we're at about uh, 1 million 400 thousand military and 70 thousand soft. So we're at 5 percent. So 100-fold increase from 0.05 percent 1945 to 5 percent. Uh, and that has, uh, for one thing, that has necessitated some um, reduction in standards. But it's also, uh, in my view, been uh, detrimental in that you've seen a lot of the most um, creative, innovative um, thinkers uh, pull out of the regular armed forces and put into soft because they tend to gravitate there. Soft tends to look for people like that. And when you look at our own armed forces today, one of the top issues they're always talking about is we need to be more innovative. Uh, and my own view is that um, to be innovative, you need innovative people. You can't just, you know, sort of uh, have a checklist of how to be innovative, which is sometimes how it's approached. And so um, this is one reason I think why it's not a good idea to add more soft at this point but also um, you know, highlights the need to be careful in how you manage your overall uh, talent, because it does have an impact. Um, another point I make, too, is we are often inclined to think that uh, you know, the wars of the future are going to, you know, we're not going to fight big wars anymore, so it's going to be these small engagements. Um, so why not put more and more effort into soft? Well, um, the, uh, my counter to that is that you know, even recent history shows us that that is not, uh, we shouldn't put too much stock on that. In Iraq, um, certainly required a large force, and uh, t right now we're talking about possibly, I'm guessing people are looking at maps like that of North Korea right now. Um, there's other places where we might still do it. Um, if we ever actually decide to get nuclear weapon, get rid of nuclear weapons, as some people thought, we could probably have another big war. Um, also, even um, right there is uh, Afghanistan. If um, to do a major counterinsurgency, you can't actually just do it with special operations forces. They, as I said, they can't cover enough area. So even if you're not fighting a big um, conventional war, you're still going to need that conventional army. Um, and the final point is that, you know, generally speaking, the special operations forces work best when they are partnered with conventional forces. And, um, and so therefore, this is a point that needs to be emphasized because this really comes down to leadership. If the leaders of special and general uh, conventional units want to work together, they will. If they, if they are content to doing their thing their own way and get it, keeping all the credit to themselves, it's uh, not going to happen. So those, uh, that is a uh, sort of quick uh, summary. Uh, I'd be glad to uh, answer questions about um, any of this. Uh, so but thank you for your attention. Sir. Uh, I would largely disagree with that. Um, one of, I've, among the things I've done is write several books on Vietnam. I have another one coming out, and um, I'll make a shameless plug too for next week. We're having an event on the Ken Burns Vietnam series in uh, CSIS, not too far from here. So uh, I would encourage all of you to go to that. Uh, but anyway, that I mean that's one of the big controversies of um, over Vietnam. You know the. 
one of the biggest problems you find uh, with people making that argument is that they um, don't pay enough attention to how the war evolves. So what you'll hear, uh, and it's not just special forces, but there's, a, you know, there's this view that in the early 60s we were doing working more with local villages to help them protect themselves and uh, but then you know big evil general Westmoreland came in and said we're gonna do this in a conventional way and uh, we're gonna forget all that great stuff you're doing uh, the reality in my view is that um, since late 1964 North Vietnamese divisions start entering the country and that totally transforms the nature of the war and so Westmoreland didn't really have a choice uh, about using conventional forces. Um, uh, and even the Marine, you know, the Marines have this program they do in, in the North called the Combined Action Program where they're trying to do something sort of like what the special forces are doing with the tribal groups is, you know, building local security. Uh, but, you know, there they find, you know, if a North Vietnamese battalion comes in, your little village defense force is gonna get squashed in a hurry. So, um, uh, now w were they always completely um, careful in how well they manage that balance, say no, but I think in general, um, it was not nearly the sort of misjudgment that it's sometimes uh, uh, portrayed. I mean, there's also a contrary view, which is sort of a Harry Summers view, which was special forces said, um, you know, they wanna do all this counterinsurgency and they neglected the big unit war. And if you look in 1975, it's actually a big unit victory. Um, that dooms us and so we screwed that up. I don't agree with that either um, because there was there was a pretty good balance over time struck between having the conventional units to deal with the enemy's big units and then these small local security units to deal with the, uh, the enemy's insurgents. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I and mean, that's a very interesting question. I mean, it goes all the way back to uh, World War II, um, and it's something that has persisted, um, almost interrupted. A lot of it had started off, I think it's continued to be this way, is that, um, you know, in creating these units, they wanted to attract people, and one of the ways they did that was going around saying how awesome they are. Uh, but, you know, it's like if your kid is in this special class at school and goes around saying how great they are, the other kids probably aren't gonna like it too much. So. There's a fair amount of that involved. Um, part of it too is that um, when they're getting people for the elite units, they're taking the best people out of someone else's unit. So if you know I'm trying to do something and then um, someone decides they're gonna take my three best sergeants, I'm not gonna be too happy about that either. Um, uh, there's also been, um, I'd say we moved away from this to a significant extent, but historically there's been a number of sort of very volatile um, sort of uh, braggarts within the special operations community. The most famous of them is Dick Marsenko, who's in the book, but he was the guy who founded SEAL Team 6, um, and he was uh, you know, notorious for uh, all sorts of crazy antics. He finally ended up in jail for uh, defrauding the government, uh, but people like that have given them a bad name um, as well. And in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, what happened early on, particularly Iraq, is the special operators, once we went into counterinsurgency, the, the conventional forces would cover a certain geographic area. So, you know, say my battalion's covering this city, uh, special operations forces might show up in the middle of the night without telling me, uh, arrest somebody, maybe get in a fight with some people, and then leave with a bunch of you know dead bodies and angry wives you know running around and so that created a lot of resentment between the two and eventually said that that got sorted out but it took several years um, to do that uh, again partly you know part of it too I think is uh, you know resources there's been a you know initially soft seemed like they weren't getting enough but in the post 9/11 period uh, soft have been able to get more resources and, and w when sequestration happened um, all of the armed forces except for SOF took a big cut in manpower so they you know managed to escape that and that I think was you know another source of uh, resentment again 
a lot of it, you know, as in most things with government, there's some people who are very parochial in how they approach these things and others who are much more, you know, take a broader view and you know, recognize that they need to play with others. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and I, I, and I think there's a, um, you know, I think more research has to be done, but I, from what I've done, one of the things I did with uh, Iraq and Afghanistan was look at the Army versus Marine Corps leadership. It's one of my books was on leadership and counterinsurgency, and most people tend to think that, uh, well, we did surveys. Mo most Marines, I think, viewed their officers as being more um, sort of willing to take risks, more willing to think outside the box. Um, at that time, there were almost the Marines didn't ha really have significant special operations forces, whereas the Army had special forces, which were pulling away a lot of those people who you probably would want. Um, and this argument, I mean, it's made all, all the way back in, in going back to World War II. Uh, a related component to that, which comes up especially in Korea, is uh, uh, SLA Marshall did this study that said how like one in five soldiers in World War II actually fired their weapons and. The conclusion people drew is basically there's a fairly small subset within the military that is really uh, aggressive. And so in Korea, when they take those people and put them in the Ranger battalions, there's this perception that uh, you've taken that 20% away. Now you've got all these other units that don't have that um, hard charging person in them. And so that's a big part of the reason why the Rangers will get um, disbanded uh, after Korea. Yeah, I think it's especially true in Afghanistan, which was later, um, you know, they also had the issue of you know, President Karzai was very, um, he complained a lot about what special operators were doing. I think a part of that was, um, a big part of that was, it happened at a time when the U.S. kept accusing him of corruption, and so whenever we said, Karzai, you're being corrupt, he, he would bring up, oh, you're doing these terrible night raids, and, and he would even, you know, he would accuse American forces of doing bad things in night raids that didn't happen. So that was part of it. Um, you also had, I do think, um, in the latter parts of Afghanistan, there was more risk aversion. There was um, a lot more restrictions put on of the type um, you're talking about. I mean, that's also you know, one of the problem. One of the virtues of special operations forces when they're small is that they can be. Um, you don't have to deal with a lot of bureaucracy, but as they get bigger, um, you have more and more. Uh, it's, uh, I spent some time at SOCOM. SOCOM headquarters is extremely bureaucratic. Now, when you get in the field, it's not uh, the same, but um, uh, we certainly have seen, uh, we saw in the latter parts, it, it becoming more bureaucratic in Afghanistan. And then what we've had since then, um, well, we're still doing things there, but the other problem you've had is um, SOF wanted to go into a lot of other countries and do what they did in Iraq and Afghanistan, and then Turns out the State Department has a say in that and almost never lets them do all the stuff they want to do. So that's a problem that uh, they're continuing to shape with. And right now, the State Department leadership is still getting, you know, stood up. So we'll see how that plays out.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they, um, you know, on the question of Europe, I mean, certainly we've seen a lot of, um, I mean, the Russians have gotten a lot of good press for all the stuff they've done recently by you know, infiltrating their special operators and civilian clothes into Europe uh, in Eastern European countries. Um, there's been, so I certainly think there's, you know, thought going on about how we use soft in some of these places, especially if, you know, allies areas get overrun. Um, that's kind of, uh, you know, new territory as far as soft, I mean, even, you know, uh, how we would actually go about handling, you know, I think the risk has gone down since, you know, for a while there was real fear of the Baltics getting um, overrun. I think now that we have more U.S. forces there, it's less likely. Um, but how you would manage that is interesting. And there's a lot of communications issues that, you know, would arise from that, especially, you know, now we see that ha how effective the Russians have been in intercepting our communications um, would, would pose a lot of challenges. Um, as far as the intelligence part, I mean, yeah, that's certainly, you know, very, very interesting subject. I mean, early on, soft were not really, aside from when they were with the OSS, were, were not all that involved in intelligence matters. Um, with the, the Iran uh, hostage rescue, it became an issue because soft felt like the CIA was not getting them enough information and sent their own people into Iran to, to get information. Uh, and that's been kind of a, a theme we've seen again where there's sometimes a perception that um, CIA is too risk averse um, or simply just doesn't have the means. I mean, you know, Benghazi, you know, kind of reinforced this problem that uh, um, reluctance to put people in these highly dangerous countries. And so um, SOF, I think, probably makes sense for them to have taken a greater role, but they'll never, you know, I think they'll, t they'll certainly never have the same capabilities as the CIA. So th that, too, is a case where um, there's a strong need for collaboration and where it's really, um, varied according to, to leadership. I mean, the last, certainly in the last, since 9-11, we've seen some cases where it's worked spectacularly well. Like General McChrystal, probably the well, but most best known example of getting the CIA to work with them. But we've seen a lot of cases, too, where they've um, really have tried to not do much with each other. getting to lunchtime, so. <laughs> Thank you, it's been a pleasure.